We are blessed to be together. If you're visiting with us. You are our honored guest. We're glad that you're here. We've got people from all over the country here today, and that is uh, a blessing for sure. Before we begin, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We can't thank you enough for the peace that you've given us through Jesus Christ. That even when it seems like the world around us is full, full of turmoil and stress, we can sing triumphantly, it is well with my soul. Father, we realize that there is so much in this life that we do not control, that there are so many things that are going on around us. The world keeps turning, and Father, we can't help but thank you for the continuity that we find in you. The promises that you give us that never <coughs> fail. The love and mercy and grace that never ceases. Father, be with us today. And throughout this week, Father, I pray that you will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Father, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. In 2017, Gallup ran a poll asking people the question, how often in your daily life do you experience stress? And they were given four options, the option being never, rarely, sometimes, or frequently. How often do you encounter stress in your daily life? And 44% of the people that were asked said frequently they encounter stress. 35% said sometimes they have stress in their life. And 17% said rarely. And only 4% said never. The way we've constructed our schedules and our workforce, the way we pattern our lives after one another has led to this kind of statistic. We run ourselves ragged. We work hour after hour. We busy ourselves with activity after, after activity. And what does that ultimately come to? Does more work free us up to relieve some of that stress? Do more things that we feel like we need to do, do those things relieve us of stress? Well, the statistics would say no. If you really look at that statistic, if you add the frequently and the sometimes people, you have 79% of the people polled that say they encounter stress consistently. <clears throat> That should open our eyes to the problem that faces us in our world today. Our mental health is a real issue in our country. And the Bible, believe it or not, has a lot to say about it. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Before we get too far, I want you to listen to me very carefully. There are situations and there are circumstances where you or I might need professional help. And in those instances, please get that help. There are so many resources nowadays that were not available in years past. So if you are dealing with a clinical issue, that is not what I'm talking about today. So please get help if you do need it. However, the majority of situations in our life can be solved or made a lot better if we followed the instructions of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which pass, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. 
Instead of worrying, he says, give your concerns over to God. Sure, do something about it. Hand it over to God through prayer. Be thankful about what you do have. Because we know that God is able to handle our problems. He is big enough to handle. There is not any, there's not too many problems for him to take on. And he says that the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, let's unpack each of these individual phrases to understand what it is Paul is trying to say. He says, first of all, to be anxious for nothing. This verb construction in the Greek could actually be translated, stop being anxious. And wow, don't we need to hear that today? Stop being anxious. We can think to ourselves and we should think to ourselves, let's slow down a little bit. Because in the middle of our anxiety, in the middle of our worries, our mind is racing through all of what could happen, what might be, and what's going to take place, and who's going to say this, and what's the, how this is going to take place. We need to slow down. And to remember that Paul encouraged us not to be anxious. This Greek word is actually used in Jesus' teachings. If you remember, Jesus had a lot to say in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, he actually talks about the physical things of life and he told, tells us not to worry about those things. And in that section on worry, Jesus asks a pretty insightful rhetorical question. In the English Standard Version in Matthew 6 and verse 27, Jesus asked, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And I like the New Living Translation on that passage as it asks the question this way. Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? As much as we worry... You would think that worrying solves the problem. But we know that all of our worries don't solve the problem. So we might as well ditch anxiety, at least to the best that we can. And again, I'm talking about our daily lives and instances where we have control over what we are thinking about. We should let go of anxiety because anxiety solves nothing. <clears throat> Being wor worrying and, and worrying about the days and the things that are ahead that might not even happen do not solve anything. Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And the answer is no. Instead of worrying, Paul, what do we do? He said, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. We pray to God about the things we're concerned about. So if you are anxious and if you're holding on to something, make sure you take it to the Lord in prayer. You've probably seen something like this before on social media the phrase, let go and let God. How we do that, or at least part of how we do that, is by praying to God about what we're concerned about. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is about taking our needs to God because we know that God wants to help us. In the passage, he says prayer and supplication. If you look at the Greek word for supplication, you'll realize that that is often translated prayer in other places. He actually has two different words for prayer. But supplication in that specific word should be translated as an urgent request or defined as an urgent request to meet a need exclusively addressed to God. Supplication, a supplication would be a more specific prayer. There are times that we pray, Lord, help me to get through the day. I know I have a difficult day ahead of me. And that would probably be just a prayer. 
Whereas in this instance, the supplication might be, Lord, I have a very difficult meeting right now. Lord, help me through this meeting. Or perhaps, Lord, help me to reach others in the community. That might be a more general prayer. And a supplication might be, Lord, help me reach the specific neighbor that I am going to talk to in a moment. We have prayers that are more general. And we have prayers that are more specific. But all of our requests should be made known to God. God can help us through So Paul tells us to be anxious for nothing. He doesn't say, okay, we'll just sit around and think about it. Pray to God about it, is what he says. And you'll notice that there is a significant attitude or something that should accompany our prayers. Our prayers should be done with thanksgiving. Isn't that what he said? We shouldn't be like children, like, gimme, 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 come on. Give me what I want, Lord. Fix this for me, Lord. And while we might ask for help, we all should be more thankful in our prayers. Lord, help me get through this. I thank you for all the times that you've helped me before. I thank you for this situation that I'm in. I'm in a difficult spot with my job, but Lord, thank you for my job. Lord, thank you that I have an opportunity to provide for my family. Father, help me to do that in a better way. Whatever you're concerned about, don't have the selfish gimme, gimme, gimme. Sure, ask the Lord for your needs. Ask the Lord to help you through your anxiety and your worry. But make sure, make sure you tell the Lord all the things that you're thankful for. Because he has given us so many reasons to be thankful. Thanksgiving breeds thanksgiving. When we count our blessings, we find more blessings to count. And oftentimes, if we think of this as a ledger, perhaps we are worried about something. Problem X. And when we start listing our blessings, we realize that our blessings and our, the things we have to be thankful for far outweigh problem X. Because of all the good that God has done for us. This Thanksgiving will also breed contentment. And that's where we want to be. We want to be content. We want to be thankful in the Lord for what he has done. And notice verse 7. As we move through our passage, Paul says, and the peace of God. So when we uh, might be anxious and we, we realize we're going to ditch that anxiety, we're going to be anxious for nothing. So instead of being anxious, we're going to hand it over to the Lord through prayer and supplication. And we're going to add thanksgiving to that. We make our request known to God. So when that takes place, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You may be surprised to know, probably not, that this is not the only time that God is linked with peace. You see there, he's called the peace of, or he says he has the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Well, if you look down a little verses, a few verses later in verse 9, He's called the God of peace. Not only does God have peace, he is defined by peace. Also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 16, now the text says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. And Paul also says in Romans chapter 15 and verse 33, may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. God is the God of peace. God made peace in our lives when we created hostility. Sin entered the world by the volition of man. It was man's choice to go against God. And God put it or or decided within himself, determined within himself that he was going to fix the enmity that we created. God makes peace. We were at war with God and God tore down the dividing wall of hostility that separated us from him. And that is straight out of Ephesians chapter two. God's peace 
also surpasses understanding. You and I, with our small brains, you and I, with our small brains, can't understand how much peace God can give us. Yeah. How does that stack up to our problems? <coughs> Overwhelming victory. And notice what the peace of God does. It surpasses all understanding, but what is the activity that it is doing? It is going to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That is another verb that needs uh, a little bit of definition or a little bit of understanding. If you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Turn there with me just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to see another instance where that Greek verb is used. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 32. At Damascus. 2 Corinthians 11, 32. At Damascus, the governor under King Eratus was guarding the city of Damascus. In order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. The peace of God guards our hearts like a governor guards a city. The peace of God guards our hearts like a governor guards a city. The peace of God is actively defending our minds. The peace of God is actively defending our hearts in Christ Jesus. Amen. So when we are praying for the God of peace to give us peace, he is going to defend our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah. If that doesn't encourage you, wow. Get you fired up. Get you excited. Yes. God is fighting to defend our peace. He guards it like a soldier who protects a city. But all of this takes place in a very specific way. It's through Christ Jesus. It's because of what Christ did for us that it is possible. You remember last week we studied the passage just a few <clears throat> verses previous to rejoice where in the Lord always again I will say rejoice let your gentleness be known to all men the Lord is at hand and as the passage continues on he says be anxious for nothing so instead of being anxious we are rejoicing and it's all taking place because of what the Lord has done we are rejoicing in the Lord. We are anxious for nothing because the peace of God that guards our hearts and minds is in Christ Jesus. He has done it all for us. And as we are beginning to close, I want you to think about your stress for a moment. Perhaps close your eyes. Think about what you are anxious about. Think about what you worry about consistently. Now ask yourself the question. Is that an earthly thing? Or is that a spiritual thing? Are you worrying about financial concerns? Are you worrying about what other people think about you? Are you worrying about something that's going wrong in your life? So often our stress and anxiety is when we're actually focusing on earthly things, when we should be thinking on spiritual things. I want to share the first verse of Love and the Outcome song, If I Don't Have You. The song I've shared before. The first verse goes, How can I build your kingdom if I'm building my own? How can you be my treasure if I'm digging for gold? How can you be my fire if my heart has grown cold? How can you be my future 
if I've made this world my home. When we look at the scriptures, we have answers for our worries and concerns. The problem lies when we're worrying about things that aren't worth worrying about. So often we need to ask ourselves, is this worth even worrying about? If it is, pray about it. God will help you through it. Don't worry so much about your money because you leave it here with you when you leave. Don't worry so much about your number of followers or the number of people that like your posts on social media because we all should be concerned about following Christ first. Don't worry so much about what others think of you because they don't determine your eternal destiny. Their opinion's not going to matter in the end. You see, not to mention, we're, we haven't even talked about the example of Paul yet. The man who said, be anxious for nothing, was sitting under guard. He was in prison himself. If we were thrown in prison, that would be first and foremost the stress of our life. How can I get out of here? But he says, be anxious for nothing. And Paul had a lot in his life going for him. He was on the fast track to be a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. He was headed for Congress. Perhaps the greatest and highest of all positions. But what did he say as we go back to Philippians, but turn back a page to Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7, Paul shares some wisdom with us. He had just outlined all the things, the reasons he had confidence in his flesh. But in verse 7, Paul said, But whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul didn't have many worries. He didn't have many things to be worried about because his life was going so well. He was so successful, but he realized that those things were not where true righteousness came from. Those things were not where happiness was to be found. Where he was going to find meaning and purpose in his life was going to be in Jesus Christ. He was willing to count all things as loss. All those things that we worry about, Paul counted them as rubbish. Those earthly things, those things that we're concerned with that are going to be gone in a moment. Paul counted them as lost. That is a high calling to live up to. Are we looking to be successful here in this life? Or are we looking to please the only one who matters. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. <clears throat> be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I don't really know what you're dealing with today. I don't know your life truly. The only person who knows is you. 
You know what runs through your mind each and every day. You notice we, we say that. Runs through your mind. We never say what walks through your mind. I don't know what you have to be anxious about. But outside of, of issues that need medication or clinical help, the Lord can handle it. And even then, praying for those people with those kinds of conditions can be helped greatly by the Lord's blessings. Whatever you're dealing with today, the Lord can help you with it. Make the decision to let go and quit worrying about it. Give it to God. Pray about it. If you need to, let other people know about it. Other people can help you bear that burden. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, Paul even tells us that we should bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The Lord can help. Let those requests be made known to God. And we've got to rely on the peace of God. And the Bible outlines that that peace of God surpasses all understanding. Praise be to God, he gives it to us. And that peace will guard, will actively guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. All those blessings are found in Christ. If you're not a Christian today, realize that that peace comes through Jesus Christ. Come and hear the word of God, which you have heard today. Hear the message of Jesus, that he is the son of God and that he was willing to humble himself and come to this earth and die a death that he did not deserve. A death that we deserve. He paid the price for our sins. Believe that he is the son of God. Be willing to repent of your sins, to turn around and start living for him and confess Jesus as Lord. And at that point, you can be immersed in water and all of your sins can be washed away. You could be raised to walk in newness of life. You could be a Christian, be a child of God, and all of your sins can be forgiven. But if you are a Christian, take these words with you this week. Statistically speaking, there's a really, really good chance you're going to be confronted with stress or worry this week. Paul's instruction would be to be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And as we looked at last week, God has given us every reason, not only to exist, but to rejoice and thrive. If you're a Christian and you've been struggling with anxiety and with worry, we'd love to help you. We'd love to help you bear those burdens. If we can help you in any way this morning to become a Christian, or to come asking for prayers, please come while together we stand and sing.